Great crowd tonight. I want to welcome everyone to our membership meeting and speaker series. My name is Nicole Netherton, the Executive Director of Travis Audubon, and we're very glad to see you this week. This is our 69th birthday week of Travis Audubon, and we're so happy to be celebrating with so many wonderful friends and members tonight. Um, if you're a member, thank you so much for your continued support. If you're not yet a member, we hope that you'll join us. You can go to the membership page on our website, which is travisaudubon.org. Speaking of our website, have you taken a look lately? We have so many amazing things. It's almost hard to keep up, but I thought I would highlight just a few for you tonight. Um, you may have heard that Birdathon signup is live. And the great news is because we are now in stage three, you will be able to bird in small teams if you want to. So that's great news. That's an update from last week. Please visit our website for the updated COVID safe regulations and you can sign up today. You can also support your favorite birder in our second annual birding brawl. Celeste, Byron, Victor, and Lori will compete in a big day in support of Travis Audubon, and we hope you'll support them. Uh, we also have really cute new Birdathon merchandise up on our website, which you can pre-order before the end of the month. And we hope that you'll really enjoy migration this year as well as help Travis Audubon with this fun and important fundraiser. Uh, speaking of migration, we are participating in Lights Out Texas with a team of partners. So in Austin, we need your help to make it a success. If you can turn off all non-essential indoor and, and outdoor lighting and, and, from and 11 okay, p.m. to 6 a.m. Okay. If you can uh, turn off your non-essential indoor and outdoor lighting from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., really anytime, but especially during peak spring migration, which is uh, April 19th through May 7th. We also have a limited number of lights out yard signs that can help spread the word about this initiative. If you want to sign up to have one in your yard, we'll drop a link in the chat. It's also available on our website. We are also undertaking a survey of our membership where you can tell us about what we're doing well and perhaps what we could be doing better. We'll also include that link in the chat and it will be in our e-newsletter. Uh, we're very interested in hearing from you and we um, invite you to share your feedback with us. You might have seen that Baker Sanctuary has been closed because of damage from the winter storm, but we'll be partially reopening this weekend, which is great news, and we're supposed to have good weather to go here, Golden Cheeks. Thanks very much to our steward, Chris Murray, for all of his effort to get the sanctuary back in shape. Thank you for your patience as it's been closed. Uh, members, you can look for an email about that tomorrow. And finally, as we get started, some housekeeping. If you could please mute your microphone and close your camera. Thank you in advance. Also, if you could enter any questions in the chat for the Q&A session at the end, we'll be sure that Sue answers them for you. And you can look for the recording of this meeting on our social media channels after we're done. So that was a lot, oh, goodness. Uh, but now it's time to introduce our friend Jane Tillman to introduce our fabulous speaker. Hi, Jane. Hi there. Well, I know y'all are here to learn all about hummingbirds and we're really excited to have Sue Heath, who's the Director of Conservation Research at the Gulf Coast, Coast Bird Observatory down in Lake Jackson to tell us all about it. So I wanted to say a little bit about Susan. She is a native Texan. She went off to, to uh, Virginia for 24 years and decided after a career, well, Navy, and then as a security analyst that um, she needed to do, do something more personally meaningful. And so she went back to school and got a master's and a PhD studying different birds. And then she came back to Texas and got this cool job here. And at uh, Lake Jackson, she has her hands in lots of pies, lots of different research and monitoring of birds, which all sounds really cool. She, she, the picture that we had on the website was of her holding some young oyster catchers, but she also studies beach nesting birds, non-breeding shorebirds. Uh, she does black skimmer monitoring. She does Eastern willet migration monitoring. And um, she studies loggerhead shrikes. And she also, I guess, heads up or participates in the Smith Point Hawk Watch. And, um, Anyway, when she's not at her job, guess what she does? She goes birding. I actually ran into her at the Spotted Rail down at Choke Canyon earlier this year. And then I ran into her in the next county over, Carnes County, because she is a county lister. And, uh, and then I just 
you know, stalked her on eBird a little bit and noticed that she managed to go out and see those rare Eastern uh, evening gross beaks that are out at Polidura, which just showed up again today. So anyway, you know, clearly she's passionate about birds. And tonight she's going to tell us all about hummingbirds. So thank you so much, Susan, for being with us. Well, thank you guys for having me. Uh, let me see if I can do the share screen correctly. Oh, come on. It's matter here. All right. Is that working? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Oh, I did not do the right button. Hold on. Let me try that again. Oh, I need to do this button. Oh, no. Wait a minute. I got to unplug my extra screen. Oh, geez. All right. Let me start over. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Finally got the bugs out. Okay. Uh, so as Jane said, I'm Susan Heath. I, uh, I'm the director of research at the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, and um, I get to do a lot of cool things. And uh, one of the things that I do that's not really part of my job um, is band hummingbirds. And uh, so I've learned a lot about them just from, from doing that. And this is a presentation that um, I've given a couple of times, but I added a few things. Um, for you guys because of some recent events. So hopefully that will uh, help to answer some of your questions. So first I'm just gonna show you some pretty pictures. And uh, this is a marvelous spatula tail there and uh, they live in Peru. That's one that I haven't been able to see yet but I'm hoping that I will be able to. Here's some more really pretty ones. I think we're all familiar with that Anna's hummingbird especially this winter since they seem to disperse all over the place. Um, but uh, you can see that there's all different sorts of hummingbirds. They have some have long tails and some have short tails, and uh, they have this booted racket tail has the little little uh, boots on the tails. Their bills are um, quite different. This, the hermits get this really curved bill, um, and of course they're all beautiful. So here's a, here's a few more. Um, just to show you some of the different variety. And of course, they're not all named hummingbird. There's a lot of different uh, names for things that are actually hummingbirds. Uh, they don't all have hummingbird in their name. So um, just a little background about hummingbirds in general. Uh, they're only found in the Americas, so that's North, Central, and South America. There are no hummingbirds in uh, the rest of the world in Africa or Europe or Asia or anywhere over there, they don't have hummingbirds. They do have some birds that are similar to hummingbirds, sunbirds and some other things like that, but they're not actually hummingbirds. So there's more than 300 species and most of them are in the tropics. We have 16 regularly occurring species here in the US and there are a few more than that that have occurred in the US, but uh, not on a regular basis. So the, the Eastern US kind of got ripped off in the hummingbird front because they've only got the one, one breeder ruby throat and there's 15 breeding species in the Western US. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the hummingbird mecca out there. They are the smallest of birds and the bee hummingbird, which lives in Cuba, weighs only two grams and is about five centimeters long. They have the highest metabolism of all homeothermic animals and homeothermic is, a, is kind of a new word for what we used to call warm, warm blooded animals, but warm blooded was not a good description of them. So uh, we have this more scientific term homeothermic. And they do go into torpor at night, which slows their metabolic rate significantly because their metabolic rate is so high that they wouldn't be able to su survive the night without feeding. So, uh, so they go into torpor and that's how they can survive. They can also survive periods of bad weather and things like that by going into torpor too. 
So um, everyone probably knows there's a coevolution of hummingbirds and flowers, and hummingbird bills are designed for the specific flowers that um, that species of hummingbird feeds on. So we have the swordbill hummingbird with the really long straight bill that can feed on a really long tub <coughs> tubular straight flower. And then we have the green hermit with a curved bill that can feed on a curved flower. And that allows them to, to get way down in there and get the, the nectar. But their primary food actually is insects. Uh, they have to have protein to survive and they get that from insects. And they eat those insects either by gleaning them off of plants or by, by hawking them just like a flycatcher does out of the air. <clears throat> so their tongues, for a long time, people thought that hummingbirds lapped up nectar, kind of like a dog or a cat laps up water, but um, that is actually not the case. Their tongues are actually forked and this, this fork, uh, there's fringes on the, the ends of those forks and that allows the bird to trap the nectar and pull it back into their mouth. And so I have a video, let me try to show this video. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna show you the whole thing cause it's kind of long, but there's the link to it. If you want to um, watch the whole thing afterwards and maybe somebody could put that in the chat. So it's there for people to see. So I'm gonna um, exit the PowerPoint and bring up my browser and try to show you this video, just part of it anyway. Let me see if I can make that happen. I've got a bunch of extra stuff on my screen here. All right, I tried to make this be set up. Oops, I'm gonna be screen. Okay, here we go. So um, this is gonna show you uh, what the what it looks like when the hummingbird actually feeds. High speed macro photography, we see something truly new. Hummingbirds' long tongues have four tips that open as the tongue dips into the nectar. A fringe of tiny filaments uncurls along the edges of the open tips, creating grooves that spring open, filling the tongue with nectar. It's a structure science has never seen before, and it's an incredibly efficient technology for picking up a liquid. Okay. I hope you guys could hear the sound on that because she was talking about it. I tried to, I discovered that you can share your sound on Zoom, which I did not know. Uh, and I tried to do that when I joined. So I hope you could see it, share it, yes. I mean. Um, so this picture on the right here uh, just is an illustration of those fringes that are on the bill. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about nesting. Uh, they make their nests out of tiny bits of plants, mostly moss and lichen, and then they bind those together with spider webs, which is really kind of cool. And that allows the nest to expand as the chicks get bigger um, because it's not rigid because uh, the spider webs can stretch. So the nests are about the size of a walnut. And as I said, they expand as a young grow. And the eggs are about the size of a Tic Tac. And hummingbirds, unfortunately, there's a lot of male chauvinism going on. Um, the male, the only thing he does is mate with the female and then he leaves and tries to find another female. Um, and that is his only job in life. The female, on the other hand, has to build the nest and lay the eggs. They always lay two. And she incubates the eggs by herself and she feeds the young until they fledge. So depending on the size of the hummingbird, incubation can range from 14 to 23 days. And of course, the smaller ones take the least amount of time. And then the young fledge in 20 to 40 days, depending on what the species is. So our, our ruby throats and black chins are on the smaller 
size of the spectrum of hummingbirds. So they, they take in the smaller range of those numbers there. And uh, everyone knows hummingbird flight is pretty amazing. Um, they can flap their wings about 50 to 80 times per second. And their heart rate ranges from 250 beats per minute when they're resting to over 1200 when they're in flight. They can fly in all directions, including backwards and upside down. And, uh, and they can also hover. And that's, it's the only species of bird that can do that. So what allows them to be able to do that fantastic flight is here's a comparison of a hummingbird wing and a Canada goose wing in flight. So if you look at the Canada goose wing first, you can see that uh, when the wing is on the down, downward stroke, the wing is fully open. But when it goes on to the upper stroke, the goose is kind of folding it in and pulling it back up so that it's not pushing air on the way back up. And that's, that's how the, the big old heavy goose can keep itself in flight. The hummingbird on the other hand, doesn't do that same action. They don't bend their wing at the wrist like that on the way up. They are pushing air in both directions and they move their wings in kind of a circular motion to be able to do that. And I just read an article today, coincidentally, I talked about how it is the upstroke on the hummingbirds flight that makes the humming noise where they get their name from, um, which is part of the reason why other birds don't make that same noise because they don't use their wings in the same way. Um, and uh, it says up there under the hummingbird thing, I, I wasn't able to change the text on this illustration, but it says most hummingbirds migrate south in the winter. Well, that's not true. Um, that's true if you live in North America, but that's not true if you live in Central or South America. Um, so. Whoever made this slide has a definitely has a North American um, slant to their to what they're thinking. Uh, so, um, so as I said, the North American species, the temperate species, ours migrate to the tropics in the winter, and some tropical species use altitudinal migration, which is if they nest at the top of a mountain during the winter, they may come down down slope where it's um, a little bit warmer in the winter. Uh, but they do not migrate on the backs of geese, as these um, illustrations show. These pictures kind of crack me up because um, they're pretty hilarious. But if you think about it, you know, hundreds of years ago when they didn't have the technology to um, actually figure out what birds were doing, uh, the thought that a little ruby-throated hummingbird could fly across the Gulf of Mexico was probably beyond their imagination. So they had to figure out, you know, what what was happening, and they came up with what to us seem like some kind of crazy theories, but um, back then, you know, probably made a lot of sense. So um, to, uh, to take on this migration, um, they en engage in pre-migration behaviors that are triggered mainly by the length of the day. Um, not, uh, and they, the weather definitely affects when they migrate, but, um, but it doesn't affect when they start getting ready to migrate. Um, that, is, that is evolutionarily triggered by the length of the day. So they increase their foraging and they can, they can actually double their weight. A, a, a ruby-throated hummingbird, typical ruby-throated hummingbird on the breeding grounds weighs about three grams. And they can double that weight to six grams when you're, when you're banding hummingbirds, like uh, if I'm banding at Rockport and uh, I catch a bird that has a lot of that fat. Uh, you can actually feel it on the bird when you have it in your hand. The bird just feels squishy and fat. And when they take off, they kind of lose a little altitude first uh, before they can get going when they're, when they're super fat like that. So here's our ruby-throated hummingbird. And it's the only hummingbird that breeds east of the Mississippi, as I said. It's, it has the largest range of all North American hummingbirds. Um, the longest distance from, I mean, the largest range meaning encompasses the whole Eastern US. And then uh, it has this long migration where it goes all the way down to the, the lower part of Central America. And uh, that's where they, most of them spend the winter, although we do know a lot of them are now spending the winter along the Gulf Coast. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So in the spring, uh, when they're coming back, they're, the males especially are in a hurry. 
to get back to their territory so they can claim it. The females are in a hurry because they want to get, get going with nesting. So they take the fastest route and that is across the Gulf of Mexico, 600 miles. So how do they do that? Well, um, and this applies to passerines as well that are, that are migrating across the Gulf of Mexico. They go when there's a south wind because that will aid them in their flight. If they took off in a north wind, that wouldn't be very wise. They, uh, they leave at dusk because they wanna fly at night because it's cooler and they build up a lot of heat in this constant flight. So they want it to be cooler. It's also safer because there's a, a lack of predators that are active in the darkness. It takes <clears throat> about 18 to 20 hours to cross the Gulf of Mexico. So they, they're gonna arrive on the coast the next afternoon. And if they hit a north wind or a thunderstorm comes through, then it's gonna take them longer. And of course, a lot of them aren't gonna make it. And that's when we have these fallouts along the coast because they're gonna hit the first, they're gonna you know, stop at the first land that they see because they've had a struggle getting across. If there's good weather and they have a south wind, a lot of times they'll just keep on going inland to get to um, better habitat. And that's why we don't have as many birds along the coast uh, when there's a south wind. There's no place to rest on this journey. Um, if you don't make it, uh, you're gonna be fish food. So um, it's, a, it's a dangerous trek, uh, but obviously, you know, they've evolved to do that because it's worth it so that they can get back to where they're gonna breed. So uh, some, some researchers did some work with the metabolic chamber just to show that a hummingbird could actually survive this flight and they used a male rheumatoid hummingbird that weighed four to five grams. And they showed in this metabolic chamber that it could fly nonstop for 26 hours. And so I'm not sure where they came up with this average speed of 25 miles an hour, um, but somebody, there must've been some other research that shows that that's about what they, what they do. Uh, so at, for 26 hours at 25 miles per hour, you can make it 600 miles across. And I mean, we know they do because I mean, I've been standing on the on the beach myself and seen ruby-throated hummingbirds coming in off the Gulf. Um, so we know that they're doing this, which is just, it blows my mind every time I really think about it. In the fall, they're not in that big hurry, that big rush to get where they're going. They can take their time. And so the bulk of them go around. And this is why we have these huge numbers of ruby-throated hummingbirds along the coast in the fall. Um, some of them may do some short hopping, you know, like they may, they may cross the Gulf and go straight from the coast by Houston, go straight across down, you know, to the Texas-Mexico border or something and do a little short hop across a part of the Gulf, but they, the bulk of them do not make a straight flight across the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this is, this is what we think based on the behavior that we've seen but hummingbirds are too small to put any kind of tracking device on. So we, you know, we don't know for sure. That day will come and when it does, I hope I get to be involved with that research because it's gonna be really interesting. So I just wanted to put up the range of the ruby-throated versus the black chin because I know you guys have a lot of black chins breeding where you are and show you the difference in uh, you know, what they're doing. So the black chin is in in the Western US. And you can see that their migration does not evolve in uh, crossing the Gulf of Mexico. They're just going down into Mexico. Then they don't go as far south as the ruby throat. So they don't have as long of a migration. Um, all, and there's also a lot of black chin hummingbirds that are spending the winter along the Gulf Coast as well. And, uh, and I'll talk about that again in a minute too. So I, I already said this, um, that the Eastern US has one species of breeding hummingbird and the Western US has 15 species of breeding hummingbirds. So if you wanna see more than just ruby-threaded hummingbirds, you need to go to the Western US or you can leave a hummingbird feeder out in the winter. Um, and you are very likely to attract a wintering hummingbird, especially uh, along the coast or where, you know, where we all are in Texas. So. There's a lot of um, myths surrounding this. And a lot of people ask me if they're gonna stop their hummingbird from migrating if they leave up their feeder in the fall. 
And the answer to that is absolutely not. These birds are evolved to migrate and a, having a food resource is not gonna stop them from doing what their brain tells them to do. Um, if you think about it, we have all these ruby throats passing through in the fall and there's tons of feeders up for them because people like to see them and that does not stop them from going on their way. Uh, the bulk of them continue on their path. So um, before a couple of weeks ago, this was, this was where I, I continued on with this presentation to another subject, but because of what happened um, three, four weeks ago, I, I talked to some experts and I got some information that I wanted to share with you guys. And uh, so I have a couple slides in here and they're a little busy, but I tried to summarize what these people told me. So um, you can read it, but I'll also go through it. So I talked to Scott Widensall, who um, is a hummingbird bander. He's also, also an ornithologist and he's done a lot of bird research and um, he's written a bunch of books. I'm sure you guys have probably all read at least one of them. Uh, so these are his thoughts kind of summarized by me. And what, what he said was, you know, what I just said a minute ago is that migration is an innate genetically encoded behavior, but it's also subject to mutation. And there's probably been a small percentage of hummingbirds that have migrated east instead of south for millions of years just because of mutations in genetics. And prior to us changing the landscape, they probably all died. But we have changed the landscape in such a way with you know, whole scale vegetation changes and climate changes such that these birds are now able to survive and pass on their genes. And so we have more and more hummingbirds coming to, uh, you know, coming east instead of going south. And his feeling is that hummingbird feeders are a relatively small part of that story. It's more the, uh, the wholesale landscape changes and climate change that is causing this phenomenon to happen. Uh, this kind of thing is also happening with other species. And he uh, mentioned the Eurasian black cat, which is uh, in Europe, obviously. And so I looked a little bit up about that. And uh, it's a species that used to migrate out of one area in Europe and is now not migrating out and is, is staying for the winter. So if you, if you wanna um, look that up, you can Google it and you'll find lots of information about that. So uh, he also said that extreme weather events will kills birds of all species. Um, feeders just, just make it more obvious to us that it's killing hummingbirds because we, you know, we have our winter birds in our yards we become attached to them and we're, we're keeping an eye on them. So when they don't make it through a storm, we notice. But there's lots of other birds, especially insectivores that probably didn't make it through that storm either um, because they, they just didn't have food. And so these hummingbirds or other birds that, that their genetics have told them to come east because of a mutation, when we have severe weather, they're gonna suffer. That, that's how nature works. And, uh, and so he, he said something that I didn't put on here that, but I thought was really great was that evolution is always throwing spaghetti on the wall to see what sticks. And, uh, and that's kind of what's happening with these hummingbirds. So then I also talked to Sherry Williamson, uh, who's the author of the Peterson Field Guide to Hummingbirds of North America. And uh, she, she said basically the same thing um, with a little different words, but pretty much the same thing. Um, she said that feeders, her, she, she said hummingbirds don't have feeder dar, like radar, you know, they don't know that we have hummingbird feeders set up in the east. So they don't have any way to know that that's happening unless they're a repeat customer and they came here last winter. Um, so feeders aren't, aren't attracting birds to come east and they aren't keeping birds here if their instincts tell them to leave. Uh, so, um, and she talked about how the hummingbirds of come east are, are pioneers that are expanding the species range and providing a hedge against extinction uh, in, in times of rapid change. So that is also how, how evolution works and nature works. Um, species evolve 
They change what they're doing. Things change based on changes in the environment. So it's, it, it is us ca causing these birds to come to come here for the winter, but it's not feeders, um, it's other things. So um, she also said that, that taking feeders down in the fall is not gonna save a hummingbird because of point number one, they're already, they're already coming here in big numbers. Um, so uh, the, the last, her last point there I thought was pretty important that during a catastrophic event like the one that we had, any, any bird that doesn't find a feeder is probably going to die. So having a feeder up might help some of them survive, but it's not, you're, not, you're not causing the bird to die because you attracted it here with a feeder. It's already here. It's feeding on you know, all the, all the uh, flowering plants that we have in the winter. And if you put a feeder out in your yard, you've just attracted it to your feeder so you can see it, but it, it was already here and you didn't, you didn't bring it here by doing that. So should you leave out a feeder? Well, clearly that's a personal decision. There's no wrong or right answer. Um, everyone that I talk to that bans hummingbirds says, you know, hummingbird feeders are for our benefit so that we can watch the birds. The birds don't really need them. They can survive fine without them. And so uh, if, you, if you don't wanna take on the responsibility of having a, you know, having a feeder up in the winter, then, then certainly, you know, take them down. Um, but if you want to leave one out or two out, it's important to know what to do if severe weather does arrive, because that is the one time when the bird will need the feeder. So I put together a few ideas, um, and a lot of this is based on uh, things that I saw on Facebook. People came up with some pretty ingenious ways to, um, to try to help their birds out. So one thing you can do is increase your sugar solution from four to one to three to one because the higher ratio of sugar will uh, make it freeze at a lower temperature or keep it unfrozen until a lower temperature. Um, if you are an early riser, you can take your feeders in after dark and put them back out at first light. But um, it's really important that you don't oversleep and that you do get that feeder back out if you choose this method. So uh, it, when it's you know below freezing all day, you can have a couple of sets of feeders and when one starts to get frozen and you can swap it out with a fresh set from inside the house, if your house is warm inside. A lot of us had a problem where our houses weren't warm inside. Um, and you can also put a source of heat on the feeder to keep it from freezing. And there's a couple ways you can do that. This is, this is what we did at our house. Um, this is just a very cheap work light. Uh, doesn't cost very much at Lowe's or Home Depot. And this is just a floodlight. Uh, it's, not, it's not a specific heat lamp or anything like that. It's just a, it's just a light, uh, you know, any light bulb's going to generate heat. That kept that feeder un, unfrozen and uh, we had two buff bellies and a rufus and they used it extensively. And we also had a bunch of other hummingbirds show up that, you know, were not regularly in our yard. So I'm not sure where they came from, um, but that just shows that, you know, there's a lot of hummingbirds out there that we don't know about that aren't dependent on feeders. But during that really cold spell, they were dependent on feeders and they, they found ours and they used it. Um, our, little, our little Rufus came uh, early one morning and just sat right there and warmed himself up. It was kind of cute watching him. Um, I've been told that you can use chemical hand warmers too if you tape them to the feeder. Uh, that might keep it from freezing for a while. But of course, you have to have electricity to do this kind of stuff. Um, so if your electricity goes out, then this is something that I saw on Facebook that I thought was pretty ingenious. You can get a metal bucket or a clay flower pot or something that's not gonna melt and put a candle inside of it, light the candle, and then you cover that bucket or flower pot with a pie pan or baking sheet or something that's flat that you know will transmit heat and then put the hummingbird feeder on top of that. And uh, that the heat from the candle should be enough to keep it from freezing. Um, and the, the, you know, in desperate times, the uh, uh, during normal weather, a bird probably wouldn't go to a feeder sitting on uh, something like that because they like to, they like it, they don't like to have stuff around the bottom of the feeder. But in desperate times, um, they will definitely use that. So that, that's my suggestions. And, um, you know, of course, you have to do your own thinking about that and decide 
how you want to proceed from, from here on out with uh, winter hummingbirds. So uh, we have 10 species of hummingbirds that regularly winter in the Eastern US. And uh, I don't know if regular is right for some of these because costas is pretty dang rare, but it does happen. Um, and there was a, a number of uh, annas and broadbills around this winter. Um, the annas probably mostly had left before we had that breeze, so hopefully they are all okay. Um, I do know some broad builds that, that probably didn't make it, um, but that's how nature works, unfortunately. So this is our little rufous hummingbird. That's the most common one we have in the winter. And uh, this is the range on the right side. There's the range of the rufous hummingbird. So they, they breed uh, north of California on the west, along the west coast and they spend the winter in Mexico, or as the thing shows, along the Gulf of Mexico, but that is that is actually not very accurate um, because there's rufous hummingbirds all over the Eastern US um, regularly. In the in the more Northern states, you know, there won't be very many of them, but I think in Pennsylvania this winter, they had more than 10 rufous hummingbirds uh, spend the winter. So they can survive very cold temperatures and in, in, in very cold environments. So just some amazing facts about uh, some rufous hummingbirds that were, this is what you can learn from banding. Um, so some neighbors of mine had a, a female rufous that they called Big Mama and she was banded. So we knew it was the same bird. She came back to their house for nine winters. Um, and then there was a female rufous banded in Alabama that also came back for nine winters. And uh, at my house here in Lake Jackson, I had a black chin hummingbird that I banded when it was a hatch year bird. And uh, it came back to our house for 10 winters, which is pretty, uh, it all, she almost broke the longevity record for black chin hummingbirds. She missed it by a couple months. Um, and then, you know, there's just more and more. This, this slide is actually kind of old. Um, there's been more and more and more and more and more uh, data showing that these birds will come back to the same house and the same feeder uh, year after year after year. So there's, this is the record setting Rufus and this, this record still stands. Um, in January, 2010, a friend of mine banded a female Rufus hummingbird in Tallahassee, Florida. And that bird was recaught on June 28th of the same year uh, on its breeding grounds in Chenega Bay, Alaska. So that is a distance of more than 3,500 miles. And it's the longest distance between a banding and a recapture ever recorded for any hummingbird species. So I mapped that out on Google Earth in a straight line, just so you could get, get the scope of this. But you have to realize that this bird probably did not make a straight line flight like that to do this migration. It probably went down the west coast and then flew east. Um, because at the time when rufous hummingbirds are migrating, the center of the country is um, not so hospitable for that to happen. So uh, it probably flew a lot more than 3,500 miles when it made that migration, which is just incredible. So uh, I talk a little bit about gardening for hummingbirds. Um, the picture on the left is my neighbor's house. It doesn't, they don't know I have their picture in my presentation, but it's a very good representation of a yard that is a desert for birds. Uh, and I guess I shouldn't use the term desert because there's a lot of good things in deserts for birds. So I need to come up with a different term for that. Um, but anyway, that bird has no, that yard has no resources for a hummingbird. Uh, picture on the right is a yard in Houston from another friend of mine uh, in her entire front yard, she has no grass. Uh, that is what her entire front yard looks like. Uh, that is an oasis for birds, and she usually has probably 10, at least 10 wintering hummingbirds every winter. So I, uh, I just made a list of some of my favorite plants for hummingbirds, and of course there's many others, uh, but these are some of the ones that I like the best. And uh, put some pictures in here of each of them. Sadly, that's what my yard looked like before the freeze. Now it does not look like that at all. So this is a uh, porter weed. Comes in a couple of different colors, actually. Um, comes in the, I think the natural one is the purple, but then you can also get a coral color. Shrimp plant, um, the, the birds love it. 
uh, we almost always get a rufus hanging out in our shrimp plant, but it can be very invasive. So you have to you have to keep it under control. And then we have our native Turk's cap, which makes a small red flower, and and tropical Turk's cap, which makes a big red flower. Um, and again, I had a whole bunch of tropical Turk's cap in my yard until the freeze, and now it's all dead. Uh, but it's not dead at the roots. Um, we we started cutting off the dead stuff last weekend and there's new shoots already coming up. So um, it kind of has to be chopped back every year anyway, because otherwise it gets real leggy and out of control. Uh, Hamelia is one of my favorite um, hummingbird plants. That The one in that picture has been trimmed to be round like that. That's They don't normally grow like that. They normally grow straight up in, in uh, straight shoots. And then uh, fire spike is also another one of my favorites. Hummingbirds really. Um, like all of these. And then there's uh, probably hundreds of different species and colors of salvias uh, and hummingbirds, like all of them. They can also be invasive, they spread very easy. So um, they're really pretty, but if you don't want them all over the place, all over your yard, you have to keep an eye on them. So I like to talk about feeders uh, because feeders are important and um, I, we use a four to one mixture. There's a lot of debate about this. Um, I read a research paper where uh, they, they compared four to one and three to one. And the, you know, the thinking is that four to one represents the closest, um, the closest similarity to what's in natural flowers. But then I read another paper that shows that, you know, if you up the mixture, the birds don't have to come as often because they get more sugar in each visit. So four to one was designed to keep the birds coming back to the feeder so we could see them. So I don't really know what's the right answer. Um, you can make your own decision on that one. Uh, it's not gonna hurt the birds to do three to one, that's for sure. Um, but please don't use any of the pre-made mixes or red dye. The pre-made mixes are just a way for a company to make money. The birds do not need those additives that are in there and red dye especially can be bad for them. Their systems have to process that dye. And uh, when I'm banding hummingbirds, I can always tell when somebody has a feeder up with red dye because I can see it in the bird's excrement. Um, it comes out red instead of clear. So to, in my mind, that can't be good for the bird and there's no need to put it in there. Uh, the, you know, the red on the feeder or whatever color the feeder is, hummingbirds are attracted to more than just red flowers. So um, a feeder, any brightly colored feeder is going to attract a bird. So you don't need to put that additive in the water to attract them. The most important thing is to get feeders that are easy to clean. So everyone has their favorite feeder. The ones pictured there are mine because they come apart and they're really easy to clean. Uh, you just want to make sure that you don't get mold inside the feeder that's hard to clean. But if, you, if that does happen, you can soak the feeders in a, um, a uh, water to Clorox mixture of 10, 10 parts water and one part Clorox. Just soak them in there for a little bit. That'll get all the mold out. And uh, then you just got to make sure you rinse them really, really well before you use them again. So in, in Texas, because it's so hot uh, in the summer, you have to clean your feeders pretty often to, to keep them from getting mold. And uh, if you look at your feeder and the water's cloudy, then you definitely need to clean it. So that's a, that's a good guide for how to take care of that. So um, this is just our, we have an event at GCBO and hopefully we're gonna be able to have it again this year uh, called Extreme Hummingbird Extravaganza. We do it two weekends in September and uh, it's, you know, we do it during the peak of the migration. So you can come and learn about hummingbirds. We have some, uh, we do presentations and we sell hummingbird plants and we um, band hummingbirds. So you can see hummingbirds get banded and you can symbolically adopt one. You don't get to take it home with you, but you do get a certificate that you know says your bird was adopted. And then if your bird gets um, seen somewhere else or recaptured or something, then we will contact you and tell you that your bird was caught somewhere else. And we'll know that because it has a band on it. So we'll be able to tell. And that's our, uh, that picture is kind of a silly picture of me with our hummingbird mascot. And uh, his name is Sir Archie. 
And if anybody can figure out where that name came from, I'll give you some brownie points. Uh, it does have to do with the scientific name of a, of a hummingbird. I'll give you a little hint. Uh, and so I guess we can take questions now. That picture there is a little buff-bellied hummingbird that I abandoned in the winter one year and it was cold outside and he did not want to leave my finger because my hand was warm. So he was started out in my palm and he worked his way all the way up to the tip of my finger and then he sat there for a while until finally I shooed him away because I had some other birds to ban. So um, if we have time for questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much, Susan. So much great information. Do you have a couple of questions? Um, one is about nesting platforms for hummingbirds. If you know whether they work and if you have recommendations for placement, if you know anything good that you can share about nesting platforms. I have not actually heard of a nesting platform for a hummingbird. So I have no info on that. I don't know. Fascinating. Okay, whoever asked that question, if you have a link or something you want to share, you can pass that along to Susan. That's that's fascinating. Um, do hummingbirds have more than one nest per year, or do they just focus on the one? Yes, they they the can have nest. depending on where they are. Um, you know, here um, where we have a long summer, they can have they might have up to three broods. Further north, in the northern part of their range, they probably only have two. And are they like other birds where they have two um, eggs, but usually only one survives or do they, do they typically both survive? No, but typically both will survive. Okay, that's better. <laughs> um, are there hummingbird plants that grow in shade that you can recommend? Shade. Um, hmm. I have to think about that. Uh, we have a lot of shade in our yard. Um, the porter weed does pretty good in the shade. And I think, I think, I don't think any of those ones that I put up there are like full sun all day. Uh, most of them are probably partial, partial shade. Um, you might have to do a little research on the internet about that, but I know our porter weed's definitely in the, in the shade and it does pretty good. Somebody just put in the chat that yeah. Turk's cap does well in the shade too. Yeah, I think it can tolerate anything. Um, a question about the hummingbird tongues was fascinating about the, the forking in the video. Do their tongues also use capillary action? I, I don't think so. I think that was an old theory about um, how their tongues worked. And I think that's been debunked by that graduate student who did that fantastic research. Cool. That, that whole video um, is pretty cool. If you, if you watch the whole video, it shows how, they, how the, that guy did all that research. It's really interesting. It's about five minutes long, yeah. the whole video. That was from a Nova or a Nature episode, right? Yeah, it's from PBS Nature episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are you involved in the Rockport Hummingbird Festival? Yes, I, I'm one of the banders at the Rockport Hummingbird Festival. Great. Hopefully people can go see you this year. Um, if you don't put up feeders in the winter, when is the right time to put them out in the spring? Um, I'd say about now, maybe a little earlier than now. I, we just started seeing ruby throats about a week ago. So, you know, mid, mid March is probably good. Maybe in a winter like this where yeah. Something happened and, and all the, the blooming plants, you know, were killed back, then maybe a little earlier, just in case an early bird shows up, you can give it a little support. Um, we've also been getting questions about the, the salmonella disease outbreak for pine siskins and people worried about whether putting out humming feeders will also encourage a, a potential outbreak among, among hummingbird species. Do you have any idea about that or any recommendations? Um, I don't, well, I don't want to give bad advice because I don't I don't really know for sure about this, but it seems to me that that would not be a problem for the hummingbirds because the salmonella is getting spread from the seed feeders from bird to bird to bird, yeah. and it's not going to be on the hummingbird feeders, and the hummingbirds aren't going to go to the seed feeder. So I don't think it should be a, a problem. Okay, that's good to know. We that's been sort of the advice, just thinking it through that we've been getting, yeah. but you never yeah. you don't want to you can't be too careful. Um, are Anna's hummingbirds expanding their nesting range east? Not that I know of, but because that's not a hummingbird that breeds here, I, you know, I'm, I'm not up on the latest research on them. Okay. Um, did both male and female hummingbirds migrate at the same time? 
No, they are they are solitary migrators. Now, when I say that, um, they don't migrate together on purpose, but like they don't migrate in a big flock or the pair doesn't migrate together or anything like that. And hummingbirds don't form pair bonds at all like other birds do. Like the male comes and mates and he leaves. He goes to find another female. Um, but birds in general are all waiting for the same kind of weather to migrate. And so like they're all gonna leave under the same kind of conditions, but they're not really migrating together. They're just all taking advantage of the same weather. And I get a related question from the same person um, there. The young, once they fledge, they leave the family group. They're, they're on their own, yeah, right? Yeah, they're There's on no their own as soon as they groups. leave. And uh, mm -hmm. because of that, the female will often, the, the young birds will often weigh more than the female does when they leave the nest because she's going to stuff them full of food so that they can make it through the first few days until they learn how to feed efficiently. Yeah, a lot of great comments in the chat about um, people, the hummingbirds that they're seeing, black chins and Hudson. Yeah, they're starting to it's show up. It's exciting. Seeing a, yeah, yeah, seeing a hummingbirds out over the Gulf on a pelagic tour one time. Um, the information in the, the nest platform, I guess this is something just for you to know or to to investigate, is dunnecraft.com is where people have seen the um, hummingbird nest platforms. Okay. So that that sounds, interesting. I, it's a, it, if yeah. the hummingbird expert hasn't heard of it, then I I think it's probably. I don't know anything about uh, it, and because it's from Duncraft, that sounds like a way for Duncraft to make some money, but I don't know for <laughs> sure. So. <laughs> okay. No, that's I'll great. Leave it at that. um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was all the questions that we got, and I know okay. we we had great. record turnout for this presentation, so we really. Uh, appreciate it. People are so interested in, in bringing hummers to their yards. And Everybody them, loves so. hummingbirds. Yeah, we appreciate you very much, Sue, and we um, hope to see you soon. Take okay. care. I hope I'll see you guys all out birding somewhere. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Thanks for being here.